So glad that you stumbled on our YouTube channel and found this sermon. Today our pastor is going to be talking about biblical womanhood as part of our beautiful design series. Enjoy. Welcome. So thank, so thank you so much for joining us today in the room and then also for our online crowd. So thankful that you have carved out the time to worship with us. I just want to send a quick shout out to Joey first before we go, go on. Thank you so much for stepping away from vacation to come lead us today for worship. And uh, I don't know for sure if he is on vacation. I'm just assuming that's the only reason one would be dressed like that. So <laughs> got him. Get out of here, Joey. Um, <laughs> He's not gonna come back to lead worship in the third service. Hey, we, we gotta dive in today because I got a lot of ground to cover, so let's just go ahead and get to it. We are in week five of this six-week series that we're titling Beautiful Design. The whole idea of this series is, you know, does it ever feel like this whole world society's kind of gotten off track a little bit? And so uh, maybe we should go back to the very beginning and check uh, what God's word has to say uh, about how life is supposed to go and relationships are supposed to go. And then maybe we can identify where we got off track along the way and course correct a little bit as we go. So that's the intention of this series. And every week is building upon each other. And so if you haven't caught the previous four weeks, I really encourage you to go back and watch those online because each week we're really building upon ourselves here. And so if you, if just, just let, me, let me bring you up to speed a little bit because we've covered a lot of ground to get to where we are at today. And so in week one, we took a look at creation and uh, the thought was, I, you know, the, thought, the theme of the message is that I just can't believe that the universe that we see and observe is the result of this lab accident gone wrong, you know, like this great accidental explosion and that that's all there is, that there's no further explanation beyond that. Like that is not intellectually satisfying, nor is it spiritually satisfying because whenever I look at the universe, I see uh, intention, I see design, I see purpose. Uh, and so that was really week one's message. Week two, uh, we got into talking about how humanity is the capstone of God's creation. Everything else, when God created it, he said it was good. But whenever he, God created man and woman, male and female, he said that it was very good. And the reason why is because he created man and woman in his own image. Genesis 1, 26 and 27 in his own image, he created it. That means that your soul has been stamped with the image of God upon it, which means that as a result, what flows out of that is that all, all, all human life has inherent value, dignity, and worth and should be treated as such. That was week two. Then week three, uh, immediately after creating Adam and Eve, he commanded them, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth and subdue it. And so God's purpose was to fill the whole earth with image bearers and worshipers who would rule on earth as it is in heaven to achieve the ultimate purpose of God in creating humanity, which is that the earth would be full of the glory of God. And so that was his purpose. Now the issue was when God created humanity, there's only two of them. And so in order to accomplish God's purpose, he created the sexes, he created male and female, he created sexuality, he created sexual intercourse, uh, all so that humanity could reproduce and fill the earth and subdue it according to the purpose that he had called man to do. Of course, that's the last thing that Satan wants. And so he shows up anywhere and everywhere all along the way in order, in attempt to thwart and frustrate and deconstruct the good and beautiful plan and design of God. That was week three. Last week, we got into talking about a biblical manhood. So if God created man, what is his design for man? What's the purpose for man? And uh, really the idea is that God has given to men in particular the responsibility and account accountability to lead in such a way and to, to serve in this role of headship in such a way that humanity flourishes. That's the idea, that he lays his own self-interest and desires to the side so that all under his authority and care would flourish and be all that God had, has made them to be. And then today we are turning our attention toward biblical womanhood. You're going to notice that I'm going to be reading a lot of my sermon today. And I'm just saying, men, if you were preaching about 
to women about how to be a godly woman, you would be careful too, you know? So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna be paying really close attention to the words uh, that I say here today. We're gonna be looking at what the unchanging word of God has to say because the world tells us a lot of co- contradicting messages about what it means to be a man or woman. And those messages change over time. That's the tricky part. Certain tribes... For example, see a man opening a door for a woman and they call him chivalrous. And other tribes see a man opening a door for a woman and they call him a chauvinist. And so how do we know? Well, it just depends upon which value system you ascribe to. Any other men? I don't know. Is it just me? You feel caught in the tension sometimes where you're like, want to open the, no, I, 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 you know, like I want to serve you. Don't want to offend you. I don't know. This is weird. What am I supposed to do? Walk to the door. You know, like anyone, I, I don't know if you've ever felt yourself caught in that tension as well. But the idea is this from God's word, what we're talking about today is that we As Jesus followers, the good news is we don't have to play that game. We can go to God's word, let him inform us of what it means to be a God-honoring man and woman. And it makes sense that if God did in fact create the entire universe and man and woman were the capstone of his creation, so much so uh, that he put so much intention and design into your life. That if God, it makes sense that if God knitted you together in your mother's womb, and if you put that level of intention into creation, uh, that he would know the design and, and how women are to flourish inside of his design. And so we're going to him. Uh, in week three, we touched on the issue of gender confusion that is rapidly rising in society. And uh, my hypothesis, at least, is that our preconceived notions about what it means to be male or female is the root of the problem, that America is confused about what gender means because we are trying to figure it out on our own apart from God, the creator and the designer. So the world tells us things like little boys are made of uh, snips and snails and puppy dog tails, and little girls are made of sugar and spice and everything nice. And I think we all just agree that a woman wrote that poem, you know? Can't we just all agree? On that, it's like, what are little boys like? Oh, you know, snot and slugs and general nastiness. And what are girls made of? Everything that's wonderful, you know? It's like, clearly, I think a woman wrote that. And I'm just saying, whoever wrote that poem, they've never had to clean a women's restroom. I'm just saying, I have. So, uh, you know, it's interesting to me that the world right now is telling us that gender is fluid. And the predominant message from the world is that gender roles are more binary and fixed. Whereas what the Bible says is that gender is binary and that while there are a couple of things of what it means to be a woman, biblical woman, and a couple of things that are inherent to being biblical man, that in general, the gender roles, it's like, it's, it, it, it could be anywhere on the canvas. Like the canvas is wide open. What am I talking about? Well, the predominant message from the world is that women are soft, tender, sensual, sensitive, sexy, emotional. But what about when they're not? Um, so my, my mom and sister, a number of years ago, they uh, took this silly little Facebook quiz test thing, you know, like what, many years ago, they took this Facebook quiz test that is supposed to tell you how masculine or feminine you are. And uh, both my mom and sister, they scored higher on masculinity than they did on femininity. <laughs> and they're like, after then, they took that, I was like, well, no chance I'm taking that test. I'll be like 95% female for sure. <laughs> Staying away from that. And... Uh, but it reveals how silly like the world's definition of manhood and womanhood is, isn't it? And same for men. The world tells us that men are strong, aggressive, leaders, unemotional, good with their hands, competitive, smelly, like to hunt, which can be true for men, except when it isn't. And I can tell you, if that's what it means to be a man, I'm out. Because uh, I, you don't want me building anything with my hands. This is my one skill right here, talking, microphone in hand. That is, that's my one skill. It doesn't go anything beyond that. And, um, and also call me crazy, but killing beautiful, majestic, innocent creatures for sport, Bambi, isn't fun for me, you know? And that's great, it is for the men in the room. But for me, my idea of hunting is hunting for a good deal on skinny jeans at the mall. You know, that's like, <laughs> that's my preferred type of hunting. So, <laughs> um, Back in December, my wife and I, we celebrated uh, our anniversary and uh, she, had, she talked me in to going with her for the first time to get a manicure and pedicure. She's been trying to get me to do that for the whole time we've been together, basically. I'm like, no, you know, I ain't doing that. 
man. And uh, <laughs> she, for her anniversary, I was like, I'll go do it. I'm a Manny Petty guy now. I'm just saying, like, guys, <laughs> don't knock it till you try it. It's like our women have been holding out on us. All I'm just trying to say, what I'm trying to say is that I think, I think um, that in actuality, the message, the messages that the world sends on gender is way more narrow than what even scripture communicates about gender, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a woman. So what happens is when men are sensitive, emotional, kind, not into sports, has an eye for fashion and design, it doesn't mean that he isn't a man, doesn't mean that he's gay, but because we are so small-minded about what it means to be a man, he is often made fun of and rejected by his peers, and he begins looking for an identity and a group that understands him and doesn't other him. And so boys and men who want to become a woman because what the world tells them it means to be a man just doesn't resonate with their soul. And women who are strong, confident, aggressive, sporty, not sensual or emotional, they're often rejected by the bell curve of femininity and it has an effect on her soul, on her identity. So she goes looking for an identity that harmonizes with her soul. And so you have girls and women who wanna become a man because what the world tells them it means to be a woman just doesn't resonate with their soul. And I get why there's confusion because you listen to all of what the world has to say about gender and it's confusing. But I would like to propose to you that there is someone who is far more qualified to tell us what it means to be a man and a woman in 2021. The one who knitted you together in your mother's womb. The one who took such care in making you that scripture says that he has counted the number of hairs on your head. The one who made you male or female. The one who crafted your little personality or big personality. The one who gave you your talents and your gifting. Why don't we let him tell us what it means to be godly woman, a godly man. So what does the Bible have to say about womanhood? We're going to be in Genesis chapter 2. That's our theme passage today. Starting in verse 18. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens and every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was no, not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So uh, today I'm just going to give you several observations about biblical womanhood from that passage. Number one is that Eve was created from Adam's side. Adam said upon seeing her, uh, she is bone of my bone and she is flesh of my flesh. This is an argument for the equality of man and woman in terms of worth, value, gifting, and ability for she was made of the same substance of Adam because she came from him. And so this idea that men would somehow be superior to women inherently in some sort of fashion is absurd uh, because Eve, first woman, came from man, made of the same stuff he was made of because she was made from him. So it's an argument for the equality of the dignity, value, worth, ability of woman. Last week, we talked about biblical manhood and said it's really about this idea of headship. But headship does not mean superiority. Headship is about responsibility and accountability. And so the New Testament really kind of explains this idea of headship uh, in detail, especially inside of uh, romantic male-female relationships. And it tells us husbands that how are we supposed to use our headship? Use your headship by laying down your very life for your wife. That's what headship looks like. Headship is about giving, not about taking at all. And so if I can just give the example uh, inside our church and how the church uh, organization and leadership works. Uh, And so my role here, I'm a teaching pastor. We have three founding co-pastors. They are our lead pastors of the church. I am under their authority, under their headship. Now, uh, because of the nature of my job, my job is about 80% similar 
to the co-pastors. Like what we do more or less, we kind of we kind of do the same roles, but I don't carry with me that headship and that role of authority that they are in. And sometimes people will come to me and they'll say things like, man, you ever want to go pastor your own church? You ever want to be a lead pastor? And I'm like, heck no. Like I've got it awesome right here. Like I get to do all the great things that they get to do, but that last 20% is a burden, you know? Like uh, they have all the pressures and stresses and the complaints that come along with leading an organization of about 5,000 people. And so they go to sleep at night and they're worried about budgets and personnel issues and, and vision for the future and all this sort of stuff. And I go to bed at night like, thinking about Texas Longhorn football, you know? Like I sleep easy because it, it is a gift. It is a gift whenever you are under godly headship and authority. And see, that's where the world has it wrong. Because why? Because the world thinks of authority and headship as, well, you can demand that others serve you. But what the Bible tells is about authority and headship is that that is the primary position of servitude. And so being under a godly head and authority is a gift. So remember, headship means sacrificing oneself for the flourishing of others. The fact that men have been assigned the role of headship does not mean that women cannot lead. I want you to hear that. Uh, it's not, this, this idea of headship does not mean, okay, men lead, women follow. No, headship is not synon synonymous with leadership. And so the idea that men are operating in headship doesn't mean that women aren't strong or courageous. Doesn't mean that they are meant to live life in the background. And, and I know this firsthand because my wife is a leader. She is a boss, you know, like in all, in pretty much all aspects of her life, she leads me. Uh, she's brilliant. I tell her all the time, tell other people, man, her brain just runs at higher RPMs than mine. I mean, she is just run circles around me and way out in front of me uh, so many times. And uh, I'm amazed at my wife's ability to care about so many things at the same time and engage in so many areas. Um, whereas for me, it's like I can care about and engage with one thing, whatever's right in front of me, and that's what I can work. But Lauren, she's able to care about and engage in so many things at the same time, and everything she engages with immediately becomes better like immediately. And, uh, and, and then in addition to all that that I've mentioned, my wife is the breadwinner in our home. And none of what I have just listed off for you runs in contrary to the idea and perception of biblical womanhood that I see in scripture. That we see women in God's word who are beasts, ferocious women of faith, appointed and placed by God, who are willing to put their lives on the line to obey God, lead and protect God's people. I think of people like Deborah from the book of Judges, that, that Deborah served in the role of judge of Israel, which was their top position of civic leadership and spiritual leadership as well. And a woman was in that role. I think inside the story of Deborah, you also have the story of Jael. Uh, this woman, you may be familiar with the story, who uh, when the, the commander of the opposing army, he thought he could step into her temp, tent and because she was a woman, she would be weak and he could manipulate her. And uh, how that story played out is Jael drove a tent peg through his temple and killed him. It's like, that woman is a beast. You don't want to mess with her. Um, I think of women like Priscilla in the New Testament who says that she was one of the earliest evangelists going around from town to town, planting churches and making disciples. I think of a woman like Mary and Martha, who is very clear from the reading the New Testament, and the gospels, that they were uh, in Jesus's inner circle and not just friends, although they were like the best of friends with Jesus. And they were ministry partners alongside Jesus, making disciples as they went about their days. As you read all throughout the Bible, you see godly women in formal and informal places of leadership. And it's not just scripture that we see it. Uh, somewhere around uh, 1972, a 16 year old girl got her driver's license and felt like she needed to go to church. She didn't grow up in a family that went to church. And so when she got her driver's license and she could drive herself, she just felt this tug on her heart that she needed to be a part of a church. And so uh, once she got her license, she chose a, a church nearby her house and she started attending there. And 40 years later, she was still attending 
in that church. When she met her husband a few years in, her, her guy that was going to become her husband, he didn't grow up going to church, wasn't a believer. She um, pulled him along to get him to go to church with her as well. And the two of them uh, spent, like I say, decades in that church doing fruitful ministry. And that 16-year-old girl was my mom. And that church was Mimosa Lane Baptist Church. And I'm telling you, I've seen it firsthand. And I honor all the women in here that they weren't waiting around for someone else to lead them and, and take them down God's path for their life. But they chose it. Uh, all the women in here who themselves turned the course of their family tree. And it, this is the picture of godly, biblical womanhood, ferocious leaders of the faith. It's important because I think especially inside the church, it is often implicitly communicated that a woman's purpose is to find a husband, assume a position of subservience. Her job is to serve and please her husband, pop out some kids. Those said kids now are her responsibility and she will forgo any career aspirations to raise them. Her job is playdates and Pinterest parties. That's what it means to be a Christian woman. That's not my argument. This is a hypothetical thing. I'm saying implicitly sometimes gets communicated to women in the church. <laughs> And some women, that's great because that is their life's passion and their soul comes alive when they do it because it's like how God wired him. But others, it is soul crushing and it's okay that it's soul crushing. And I would just like to point out to you that Proverbs 31, the most famous celebration of women passage in all the Bible paints what I think is a little bit of a different picture than what we traditionally think of when we think of biblical womanhood. Proverbs 31, verse 13, she seeks wool and flax and works with the willing with their hands. Verse 16, she considers a field and buys it with the fruit of her hands. She plants a vineyard. Verse 18, she perceives that her merchandise is profitable. Her lamp does not go out at night. Verse 19, she puts her hands to the distaff and her hands hold the spindle. Verse 24, she makes linen garments and sells them. She delivers sashes to the merchant. About half the proverb, the Proverbs 31 woman is talking about how she works outside the home and produces for the family. I think that sometimes that's a message that gets missed inside the church. I'm just trying to communicate that sometimes the picture of womanhood that people project onto the Bible is a caricature that is not an accurate representation at all what the Bible actually has to say about womanhood. Okay, so that's first observation. <laughs> this and it has come from that God took the rib out of Adam, out of his side, made Eve, and it speaks to equal dignity, value, worth, ability, talent, leadership that God has placed upon women. Next observation from Genesis chapter two is when God set out to form Eve, he formed her to be a helpmate. And so the passage that we looked at, it uses the word helper two times in the passage. And uh, we got to talk about that because the word helper, the idea of help can sound inferior and subservient at times, but that's, it's, it's not. The Hebrew word is highly contextualized and so anytime you're reading any type of literature, especially if it's of a foreign language, like you should really dive into the context to see what the words mean. And uh, same is true of English. The word fast can mean a bunch of different things. Like it, you, when you call someone fast, you can be referring to their speed. Fast can also mean that you're abstaining from food. Uh, fast can also refer to stubbornness in position. They held fast. Uh, it can also Return, be a term referring to shady dealings, you know? Like that person is dishonest. They're fast with money. Uh, so if I say, man, there is this kid on my soccer, my son's soccer team, and that kid is fast. You're not like, oh, he wasn't eating before the game. You're not thinking that. If I say, uh, Randy Wade is on a 20-day fast right now, you're not thinking in your mind that he's out in his front yard running wind sprints, you know? Although I think we'd all like to see that. Uh, that's not what it means. And you know automatically from the context what definition of the word that we are using. So this Hebrew word helper is used throughout the Old Testament. We see in Exodus 18 verse four, where it says, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from the sword. Deuteronomy 33, seven says, hear, O Lord, the voice of Judah and bring him into his people with your hands contend for him and be a help 
against his adversaries. Then in Psalm 33, 20, it says, our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. God being called helper throughout the scriptures brings honor and dignity to the position of helper. And since God has been called a helper, a helper cannot be inherently inferior. So if a woman has been made as a helper fit for him, it cannot mean that woman has been made inferior in any way. So with that said, what does it mean to be a helper? In every context in which this word helper is used and even how we use it today, helper denotes one who is helping the one with primary responsibility. So Pastor Paul McGill comes to me sometime this week and he asked me to help him with something, probably to lift something. If he asked me to help... uh, something. He is not asking me to do my job. He is asking me to help him with something that is a part of his responsibility and his job that he doesn't have the strength to do on his own. So strength is not in question here. The one who is asking for help is the weaker one who needs assistance in order to complete that which is under his responsibility. So although to be a helper is not inherently inferior, what it does mean is to come alongside the one who is primarily responsible. To draw the conclusion that women are inferior to men because they are called helpers is to make the statement that God is inferior to us because God helps us. Obviously, we know that's a ridiculous thought. So it says, it, it says that when God set out to create Eve, he set out to create a helper fit for Man, fit for Adam. That phrase leads us to this idea of complementarian relationship. That Eve wasn't made like Adam. Woman wasn't made like Adam. She was made fit for him. Man and woman are both created by God in the image of God, equal dignity, value, worth, but they have been created to complement each other, not to compete against each other. We're going to talk about that a little bit next week when what happens when man and woman begin to compete with one another. And it's not pretty. Uh, but what that what this means is that the weaknesses of one, this idea of complementary and relationship between male and female, the weakness of one is strengthened by the strength of the other. And where one is strong and the other also has strengths in that area, their strength is made stronger because of that person's strength. That's what it looks like to be in a God-ordained, complementarian relationship. And so I see this in my marriage. Uh, so I'm, I'm incredibly task-driven. I have the uncanny ability to just completely tune the kids out as I'm plowing through a sink full of dishes. And Lauren, sometimes she'll be in the room. She's like, do you not hear the kids talking? And I'm like, trick question, kids weren't talking, you know? <laughs> and uh, she's like, wow, I just can't. And I'm like, yeah, it's a gift. And uh, Lauren, so I'm super task driven. Lauren is like the most people driven person that I've ever met. And man, we need that in our family. Our kids need that in our home. And Lauren needs that if she ever wants the dishes done, you know? And so uh, it's, a, it's this beautiful compliment playing out in our home. Also, uh, so I'm, I'm task driven. I'll say eight on the Enneagram. If you know anything about that, in a lot of ways, I'm just kind of all business and into efficiency. I know it may not seem that way from my sermons sometimes, but at home, I'm not a lot of fun to be around. Uh, Lauren, on the other hand, she brings fun everywhere she goes. You know, she's like Tigger from Winnie the Pooh. It's just like springing her step, bringing the joy and the fun to life everywhere we go. I need that so much in my life. And then uh, I'm risk averse. And Lauren, she doesn't feel alive unless there's something riding on the line, you know? And uh, so all I'm just trying to say basically is I'm lame and Lauren's awesome. And uh, (laughs) now I am being recorded. Love you, babe. Uh, So, but I'm kind of, I'm making jokes about it a little bit, but this, I mean, this, this is a picture to an extent. This is just a snapshot, just showing you a few of the ways that the beautiful complementarian design is playing out in my own marriage. And where there there is this type of relationship and partnership, that's the key word, there is the human flourishing that God created us for. So what does this idea of woman being a helper fit for him, what does it look like played out in the home? For a woman to come alongside a man in his responsibility to order things so that humanity might flourish. Well, we see it explained in Ephesians chapter 5. And a lot of people get hung up on this Ephesians chapter 5 passage because uh, it uses the word submit. In Ephesians 5.22, it says, Wives, submit to your own husbands as the church submits 
to Christ. And we don't like that idea of word, the word of submit. But if you will look at it, once again, the context is important. If you will look just the verse right above it. Like, so that's verse 22. If you look at verse 21, it says that all people are to submit to one another. And so say everyone, even if you are in authority, even if you're in a headship position, you are to be submitting to everyone else who is in your orbit and world. And so all Christians, even those in leadership, even husbands are called to submit. And isn't that how Christ, the son of God himself lived? If anyone would have been perfectly justified to lord over others and demand submission, it was Jesus. But that's not how he lived, is it? Instead, what did Jesus do? He washed feet. That, that's what the best example of a head and a leader, that's what he did. That's what he did with his authority, with his power. He washed feet. And, and that's about the most perfect picture of what Christ-like headship looks like right there. And it's like, who on earth would ever have a problem submitting to that type of selfless leadership? And so husbands, like, if we feel like, sometimes if we feel like our wives are unsubmissive or dishonoring to us, I... I, I, to me, when I hear that, that sounds like an indictment on our leadership and servitude in the home. Because who in the world would try to shrug off a type of leadership that is so sacrificial and serving? Like our job, what we're to do with our, our role, with our authority is to make sure others flourish. That's why scripture said in, in the book of um, Proverbs, I think, this is talking about the, the wife being like a well-watered vine. That, that's the goal, husbands, for our wives, is that man, she'd be like a well-watered vine growing in our home. So in a godly Christ-centered home, it looks like the husband submitting himself to his wife, putting her interests and needs above his own, and then the wife then submitting to the husband, not looking after her own interest. And so, uh, man, if I could just, Give you, give you a picture maybe of how this dynamic, this mutual submission plays out in our home. Uh, all, all the time when we find ourselves coming up against a big decision, it is never like, babe, I've spoken with the Lord and this is how it is. Don't ask any questions. Uh, that's not how it goes down in our house at all. Instead, it's a lot more like, man, I don't know. I'm kind of wrestling with it. What are you thinking? And Lauren will tell me and, she'll, and then she'll be like, well, what are you thinking? I'm like, well, you yeah. know. And it's, it's passing it back and forth. And I'll say like 90% of the time we go with Lauren's intuition and spiritual discernment and gut, because like I already said, like she's brilliant, so in tune with God and thinks so well. And, and, and so we, that, that's what it looks like in our home. One of the best examples of this was uh, when we had our first child about 10 years ago. At the time, I was a youth pastor here at Sea Life. My wife was a school teacher. We had our first baby at the end of one of the school years. And so the plan was all along, she'd take off the rest of that school year. And then when school started back up the next year, she would go back to work. And uh, that was just a financial decision more than anything. We couldn't make it work on one income. And so then uh, June rolled around and Lauren was like, babe, I just don't know if I can go back. And I'm like, well, I looked at the bank account and you're going back. <laughs> and uh, I'm like, yeah, you are, you're gonna, you have to. And so uh, a couple of weeks went by and she's like, babe, I just don't know. I just don't know if I can go back. And I'm like, okay, let's look at the budget. So we looked at the budget and when we worked it out with her income not being there, it's like, we we're gonna be in the red, like $1,700 a month. And I'm like, babe, like, I mean, it's just numbers. We, we can't do it. And so then um, a couple more weeks pass and she's like, ah, babe, I just, oh, it's like growing. I just don't, I really don't think I'm supposed to go back. I feel like God's telling me to stay home. I said, okay, let's look at the budget again. See, let's get even more radical. Let's cut out more. So we cut out more. And at that point, we're still, now we're like $700 in the red every month. I was like, I'm sorry. Like it's, I hear you. And maybe, maybe someday we'll get there. And uh, so then a couple more weeks passed. It's like the first of August, I was on a high school mission trip with our kids and I just call home to check in with Lauren and she leads with, I'm not going back. Can't go back, not going back. And so I'm like, okay, okay. Let's look at the budget. Again, we looked at the budget again and uh, now we're getting super radical. You know, we can sell the pets and, uh, <laughs> and it, we were still gonna be in the red like 300 bucks a month. And I was like, okay, well, we've got enough savings to give it a try 
for at least a year if you feel like this is what God is leading you to do. Let's do it. And I'm just saying, like, this, this is how, I think, that, I think that's how the dynamic is supposed to play out in the home. That's what mutual submissiveness uh, looks like to where the husband is not using his authority to send down edicts to the rest of the family, but instead he is submitting himself to the things that God has placed upon the heart and soul of the spouse. And that if you want the best family and the best home life, well then husbands, we ought to submit to our wives. And here's the crazy thing about it. My wife, while she is one of the most aggressive individuals I know and one of the most ferocious leaders that I know and, and about, she is totally capable and competent. She doesn't need me in life at all. She'll be just fine without me if the Lord takes me out someday. She, she doesn't need me, but still, incredibly strong leader, woman, competent. She still, she longs for me because godly woman, she still longs for me to lead. She still longs for our family to move forward under my covering. Because this is, I mean, God, God has wired it into her soul alongside with these incredible gifts he has given her as well. So, um, I know some of you may be saying, well, this is really easy for you to stand up here and preach. Some of the women are like, you know, you can talk about submit. And I'm sure, yeah, it's easy for Lauren to submit. You're a pastor. Um, but my husband, he didn't care about God or follow God at all. And I understand that. I'll just say that Ephesians 5, 22, when it says, why submit to your own hub- husbands as the church submits to Christ? Like, there's no caveats on that. It just says, like, just do it. Just like the church submits to Christ, like you just submit to him. And then again, in uh, 1 Peter 3, verse 1, listen to what this verse uh, says. It says, likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word. This is talking to women who are married to ungodly men. Like, so even if your husband is not a godly man, even if he doesn't care about God, doesn't care about the Bible, be subject to your own husbands. Husbands, even if some do not obey the word, that they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives. And let me just tell you, women, when I'm acting like a jackal, uh, as, as I do with more frequency than I should toward my wife and in our home, toward our kids, the most convicting thing in the world to me, the thing that most that is most transformative on my behavior is when Lauren still honors me and treats me with dignity and value. That's when I start to feel like, oh gosh. And whenever she starts to like kind of hone in on some of my faults and go after certain things and it, and it feels dishonoring, that's when oftentimes whenever I dig my heels in. And so maybe scripture has some wisdom to impart to us in First Peter 3, 1, where it says, hey, you know, you got a man who's not acting the most godly, be subject to him still and see the work of conviction that God will do in his soul. Um, so let's turn to a different passage, Titus 2, 2, 5, and then 5 through 8. Actually, before I go there, let me, let me do a little bit of a disclaimer here, because I know that I'm talking a lot today about being married and spouse, and so so much of the conversation today has been, been, been about being conjoined to a man in marriage covenant. And uh, for every woman in here who is not married, don't hear me saying that you need a man in order to realize your life's purpose. I'm absolutely not saying that at all. Remember the, the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 7, he actually says, it's better to remain single. Don't say amen there. That's Paul's words. <laughs> Because then you can devote your whole life to your spiritual calling, which is making disciples. So single women, you have the full image of God impressed upon your soul. Don't sit around and twiddle your thumbs waiting for a man to come and ask you out on a date before you get about your life's purpose, which is changing the world, raising up disciples. Man, in a very real way, the biblical argument here is if you're single, these are your best years for ministry effectiveness. That's what the Apostle Paul says. For a married person is distracted by marital duties and responsibilities. And, and so, man, you, you get to go full force into your eternal purpose. And so there's lots of ways to do it. One way, you can join the youth team, get a gaggle of junior high girls around you, pour your life into them. Ask any parent of teenage girls in this room, you will be a godsend 
And for these few years, you could be the most influential person in their life. And you could develop relationships that decades from now, you still have a voice of authority and input in their lives. I think of women like uh, Lacey Lansdale, who is one of our uh, small group leaders back when I was a youth pastor for Sea Life. She was a small group leader on our Forney campus. And she was a single woman who desired to be married, but she wasn't just waiting around like, uh, just waiting for some man to pick her up before she started living her life. No, instead she started pouring into this group of seventh grade girls in their CG. And I'm sure it, would, it required a lot of energy and felt like a lot of sacrifice in those early years, but she walked with them all the way through 12th grade. And, and now those young women are like 23, 24 years old, I think. And Lacey, now the relationship has evolved where it's, it's still mentorship, but it looks a lot more like friendship. And whenever they go out on a first date, they call her up to tell her about the guy and get Lacey's input on it. Whenever they get married, Lacey's in their weddings. It's like, she, she, has, she, she wasn't waiting around. Now Lacey's married. But man, she has this fruitful, continued fruitful ministry from those years of, and she was getting about the work of raising up disciples. I think of women like Jen Smith from this campus, that Jen's, Jen's a single woman. I don't, I don't know if she's here. I don't know if she would mind me saying this. Didn't ask her, sorry, Jen. Uh, but Jen just recently, she just, uh, she's a single woman. She just adopted a child. She's like, you know, why, why I don't need a man to pull a kid out of the foster system with no, mom and dad there to take care of them. I can be a mom to a kid. So she just adopted a kid. How beautiful is that? I'm just saying women don't like, wait, you have the full image of God upon you. And uh, man, you're a, you're a leader, you're ferocious in the faith. Um, go lean into God, go get active in doing ministry, form your heart and soul, get it ready to where if God ever does place a man in it, you're, your soul, your internal integrity and character will be the type of steel, the type of iron that sharpens the other iron that God places in your life. Okay, so now to Titus. <laughs> it says, older men are to be sober-minded, dignified, self-controlled, sound in faith, in love and in steadfastness. Man, one, one definition of godly manhood, there it is. That's a great definition. Then verse three, older women likewise are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. They are to teach what is good. And so train the young women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled, pure, working at home. Already we've addressed this. They can't possibly mean that they're a, they work from home only. It's talking about your primary work is raising up godly disciples in your children, which by the way, same primary responsibility for men as well. And then it tells women, be kind and submissive to your own husbands that the word of God may not be reviled. That last instruction for women, be kind and submissive to your husbands. If wives, if, if any wives we have here today, if you could just know the power that your words carry in the soul of your husband, it's staggering. I've already told you I'm an eight on the Enneagram. Uh, I, that means I kind of have thick skin. I don't really care if people like me. Uh, or not a lot of times. And uh, honestly, you kind of like it when some people don't and there's a little bit of turmoil. And uh, you, you come up after a sermon to me and you're like, that's the worst sermon I heard. It's biblically inaccurate. Uh, that like can't stand you and you're teaching. I'll never be back at this church. You know, I'm not gonna go home to Lauren and be like, oh my gosh, I think I should consider finding a new profession. You know, I'm not gonna do that instead. I am going to wonder what sort of father wound you have that would cause you to come up and treat me, this person we never talked to in that way. And you see, I, I'm, tonight, whenever I lay my head down on my pillow, I'm gonna drift peacefully into my sleep. But not so if Lauren comes at me and she says some of those same things, because man, it's just that it's something different. And while the words of no one, no one else may really affect me in that way. I can lose a lot of sleep over some things that Lauren says because she knows me and my soul is woven together with hers and there's just a power that comes along with it. And so this is why in the Titus passage it says, wives, be kind. What does that mean? That means don't be an expert in their failures. Be an expert in what they are good and qualified at. And once again, some of you be like, well, that's easy to say because, um, but, but my husband, he doesn't have a spiritual fiber in his body. Like, okay, well then just, just focus on that. Then if that's where you wanna see some improvement. So the next time that you see your husband remotely um, doing anything spiritual, encourage it, you know? This Thanksgiving, I know it's several months away, but this Thanksgiving, if it comes around, your husband prays for the meal, 
with his family and he's like, rub-a-dub-dub, thanks for the grub, you know? After, the, I know it's not a sophisticated prayer, but after he's done and just pull him away from the family and just whisper in his ear, you know, when you prayed that prayer, it did something to me. <laughs> then stick your tongue in his ear, you know, encourage him. <laughs> I'm just telling you, just harness the power that God give him power in the voice and the influence that God has given you of the man in your life. And uh, verse six says, likewise, urge the younger men to be self-controlled. Verse seven, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works and in your teaching, show integrity and dignity. And verse eight, and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opponent may be put to shame having nothing evil to say about us. And here, I gotta wrap up, but here's the idea. Strong husbands and strong submissive wives is painted as so backwards and archaic by society, but when it's actually lived out, when it's actually lived out, when men, men are leading like Christ led the church, when women are submitting like the church submitted to Christ. It's a beautiful thing. And the Bible says the world won't be able to say a thing against it. It's not degrading to women. It's honoring and exalting of women. And the world may critique it from afar, but they sit down and they have dinner with you and your husband, husband and your kids. And they see the mutual submission that is going on. And they see the honor and the dignity that your husband treats you with. And they see your respect and love and adoration for him. And they see how there's just this current of respect and love and dignity, even amongst your kids and how you relate to them. And, and although they may disagree with the concept and the ideal, when they see it in practice, they will leave that dinner feeling like, you know what? That's all I really want. That's what that verse is saying. So the, the opponents won't have anything to say. And I know if, you've, if all you've ever been around is ungodly men, I understand why this idea is unsettling. You want me to submit to that type of man? But you can't, come on women, you can't take the lowest common denominator and make that normative for all men. Just like you don't want us men taking the lowest common denominator of women and making that normative for all women. I mean, even God himself, there's a proverb that says that a nagging wife, like it's, it's better for the brother to go off and die in the desert. So God said, it's like God is looking down at some marriages and he's like, man, bro, you just go die in the desert. <laughs> you know, like, I don't, I'm God, I wish I had more for you. <laughs> But here's the deal, and here's where we conclude. Where men and women live out how the Bible prescribes, flourishing happens. The world may attack the idea of it, but they'll only attack the idea because they haven't seen it practiced. Because when you see it practiced, they have nothing to say against it. Where men are servant-hearted, self-controlled, patient, loving, have initiative, are intentional, spiritually leading in the home. When women are gracious, self-controlled, passionate, kind, joyful, pouring into the lives of others, humanity flourishes and Christ is Exalted, And so God, that's our prayer. That's our hope. Um, Lord, I pray for all of us in the room, male, female, husbands, wives, single men, single women, wh whoever it is in this room, wherever we are, Lord, would you take your word and through the Holy Spirit, would you apply it to our souls? Would you sand down the rough edges where you sanctify us, God? Would you do this work inside of us? And at the end of the day, at the end of the day, God, like where all of this starts is our personal relationship with you. And uh, we will never be able to mutually submit to the people in our lives until we have fully submitted to you. And so God, I, I, my prayer for myself and for every person in this room who would receive it, and this is the posture of our heart, our, our prayer is, God, we wanna submit fully to you. The God who came down, laid his life down on the cross despite doing no wrong for the people who wronged him. It was our sin who nailed him to the cross and yet you submitted to us, laid your life down literally, figuratively too, and spiritually for us. And so God, he is our example. He is our God. And if we can live life like that, if we can go through our, our days, laying our life down for the flourishing of others, Lord, we know, we, we, we know that there's a beautiful reward that lies ahead. And so God, I pray, I pray that you would breathe new hope into some souls today. I, I pray that you would, Help us turn a corner and have a vision for the person that you've called us to be and the strength in Christ to walk in that. Lord, it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.
Amen. We hope that you were challenged by that message today. If you'd like to see the rest of this series, go ahead and look at the rest of our sermons on this. It's all beautiful design. This is sermon five in the series. And if you'd like to contact us, there's a link in the description below. We would love to talk to you, pray with you, encourage you, whatever we need. We'll see you next time.